So as Hannah said earlier on, we're starting a new series today, which we're calling Exiles, Life Between Two Worlds. We're going to be particularly over the next eight weeks or so in the book of First Peter, which is one of the letters that we find in the New Testament, the second part of the Bible. And uh, it's written by a guy called Peter, unsurprisingly. And uh, we're going to be de- delving into that book over the coming weeks. We like to do that as a church. We like to go through whole books of the Bible. Um, Sometimes we do topical series, which we've done last year, and we'll do some others uh, this year. But more often than not, we like to go through whole books of the Bible so that we are forced to go over the bits that are difficult to understand. Because if we don't do that, we, we as preachers might pick the bits that are easy to understand. And, uh, but actually, as we go through the book of the Bible, we're going to come across some things that um, we, we're going to kind of have to work through to get, kind of really get the meat from. We're going to have to really uh, do some work to understand what it's saying and to uh, nourish us and strengthen us. But we're not actually going to dive into the book of First Peter properly today. I thought it would be helpful to take a look at the person who wrote the letter to have a look at the character of Peter, who uh, is also known as Simon Peter or Simon. And we're going to look at a wonderful story from the book of John and John chapter 21. John was one of Jesus' disciples, just as Peter was. And John was one of Peter's closest friends. So he gives us good insights into the life of this man. We're going to turn there to John chapter 21. Now, if you have a Bible with you, we'll read it in just a few minutes' time. What you need to understand before we dive into this story, is that the events that we're going to read of took place in the days after the first Easter. So it's pretty apt, as we're the first Sunday after Easter, that we're diving into uh, this story. And a lot has happened in the space of a week or so. Jesus entered into Jerusalem on a donkey to the praise of the crowds. They were shouting, Hosanna, which means you save They saw that he was the savior. They were so excited about him. It was like a a, a rock band were in town. He He was the big news. But it became apparent over that week that he was a hunted man, that he was hunted by some very powerful people who wanted him gone, who were very jealous of his power and his influence, and they wanted him gone. And Jesus, knowing this was going to happen, he gathered his disciples together for a meal And they shared a meal together, and Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. Now, Peter, we're going to learn from this story, is a guy who always likes to speak up. He's not afraid of the sound of his own voice. And he says, who, Lord? Who is it going to be? As if to say, I'm going to deal with them. (laughs) Tell me who it is. And Jesus says to Peter, before this night is up, before the rooster crows in the morning, you are going to deny me three times. And Peter, once again, very happy to speak up, said, I will sooner die than deny you. I'm never going to do that. I am never going to deny that I know you, that I love you. I would sooner die. This was Peter's bold proclamation. And many of us here know how that panned out. Jesus is betrayed by Judas And in the garden, Jesus is arrested. He's taken away to be on trial. And Peter follows from a distance. And he's kind of watching what's going on as Jesus is on trial in the courtyard of the the high priest. And Peter sees a little crowd gathered by a fire, keeping themselves warm because it's the early hours of the morning. He sits down with them. He's warming himself by the fire. And a young servant girl turns to him and says, you you're one of Jesus' friends, aren't you? You know him, right? No, 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 I've, I've never heard of him. No, no, you, you, you sound like him. You, you're from north, the north, aren't you? You're one of his followers. No, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard of the guy. And then finally she asks him a third time, you know Jesus, don't you? And at this point he starts to swear and he even calls out a curse. I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know the guy. He denies Jesus. And at that moment, the rooster crows, just as Jesus said would happen. And Peter sees Jesus from a distance, and Jesus turns to look at him. And we read that Peter wept bitterly. And I don't think this was just a few minutes. I think he wept all night. 
because we don't see him the next day when Jesus is crucified on the cross. Peter is totally ashamed of himself. It's not just the act of denying that he knows Jesus, but there's the proud proclamation that he would never do that. The proud proclamation that others may leave you, Jesus. Other people who, don't, who aren't as committed to you may leave you, but I will never do this. The pride that comes before it all. And it wasn't just the act itself, but also the chances that he had to row back on it. Because to deny him once was one thing. But then he gets asked again. He could have changed his mind and said, no, actually, I do know him. I belong to him. But he didn't. He denied him three times. And he wept bitterly. And I imagine he wept and wept and wept. Because Jesus had nurtured him and taught him and befriended him for three and a half years. He'd gone wherever Jesus went. He'd seen Jesus do incredible things. Jesus had not only taught him, but he'd also entrusted him with some things. Peter was something of a leader amongst the disciples. He'd entrusted Peter on special missions. He had allowed Peter to walk on water with him. And yet Peter had denied that he even knew Jesus. This was a pretty dark moment. And there Jesus on that Good Friday, dies with most of his followers having fled. Only one of his 12 disciples there at the cross, John. And then the women that supported his ministry and his mum were there. That's it. As he dies in agony on the cross. And then we know the story, we celebrated it last week, that on the Sunday, Jesus rose again. And he appears first to Mary Magdalene, to his mother Mary, and to a lady called Salome. And these ladies run and tell the disciples. And there's this wonderful moment that John records in his gospel. And you can see why he records it this way. Because Peter and John then have a race to the tomb. And guess who wins? John. And he records it in his book. <laughs> the most important moment in all of human history, Jesus has risen from the grave. John had to get it in there that he won the race. He had to do it. I think you and I would do that. And they get into the tomb, and it's empty. It's just the grave clothes there. But who does Jesus appear to first out of all of the 12 disciples? He appears to Peter. That is amazing grace, isn't it? The one who had failed him spectacularly. He appeared to Peter. Surely that's grace enough. Well, we're going to see as we read John chapter 21, that it gets even better. We're going to read from the New Living Translation. I usually will read from the New International Version or the English Standard Version, but sometimes the New Living Translation, just with narrative particularly, with stories, it just reads really well. So this is where we're at. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. Does that sound familiar to you? We'll come to that in a little while. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellas, have you caught anything? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. And then the disciple Jesus loved, that's John, okay? So this is his gospel we're reading from, and he refers to himself as the disciple Jesus loved. <laughs> this guy is great. <laughs> then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and he headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard abroad, and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large 
fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. And then Jesus told him, follow me. Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? And Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So the rumor spread among the community of believers that this disciple wouldn't die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This disciple is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here. And we know that his account of these things is accurate. Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. I love that story. So seven of Jesus' disciples are in Galilee. These are the Galilee boys. Okay, they've gone back home. Jesus had said to them, go back to Galilee and wait for me. They weren't disobeying by being there. They were there and they were going fishing, which most of them would have done as a living before they started to follow Jesus. We know that was true of Peter. We know that was true of James and John. They knew how to fish. So they've gone fishing, and yet they've not caught anything. All night long they fished. It sounds very familiar because it's just like the story when Jesus first called Peter to come and follow him. Just like the story where Peter had fished all night long and then Jesus called out to him, throw your net over the other side. And then there was this miraculous catch of fish, so much so that James and John, these brothers, had to come and help Peter to bring in the catch. It's a very, very familiar moment. I love it how Jesus calls out to them. It's, as you read kind of different commentators on these verses, that the, way, the way that Jesus speaks, the way that it's been recorded is very colloquial. It's like, lads, have you caught anything? It's very real. It's not some sort of mystical thing. It's a very real moment. And he says, try the other side. If you try the other side of the boat. Now, fishermen who are very experienced don't like being told what to do by someone who's on the shore. When they've been toiling all night long, it's not a very popular thing to do to, start, to have someone shout out, have you tried the other side of the boat? <laughs> but there was something about the voice that came. They couldn't see, probably through the morning mist, they couldn't see who it was. There was something about his authority that inspired confidence in them. And so they do that, and they have this amazing haul of fish. And then Peter, I mean, you can see the difference between John and Peter here. John is the kind of think first, act later kind of guy. Peter is a kind of act first, think later kind of guy. John is ready, aim, fire. Peter is ready, fire, aim. Okay, they're just completely kind of impulsive kind of guy. So John perceives it's the Lord. Peter's jumping in at this point. And he's, he's swimming to shore. 
And the funny thing is, there probably would have been very shallow water. They're only 100 yards from the shore. Peter needn't have really even bothered. They would have been there within a minute, but he's in. He knows, I've got to be with Jesus. I've got to go and be with him. It's a glorious story. It's a beautiful story. And Jesus is there, and Jesus has cooked breakfast for his friends. Isn't this beautiful? Isn't this a wonderful, wonderful picture of who our Jesus is, who our Savior is? And there, in the presence of others, Jesus tenderly deals with Peter the failure. He tenderly deals with him, and he restores him. He restores him not only to good relationship. You know, eating together was a sign of, we've got restored relationship. But he restores him to work for him. This is a glorious thing. And then he takes Peter for a stroll. <laughs> and John is kind of weirdly following them. Probably not trying to earwig a little bit. What's being said here? It's a lovely story. I want to just pull out four things from this that might speak to different people in the time that we have remaining. Firstly, I hope you see this, the grace of Jesus to restore. That Jesus is full of grace to restore people. This story is very familiar to us, if you know the Bible, because it mirrors the time that Peter was first called by Jesus, where there was this miraculous catch of fish. And what happens in that moment, in that first moment where Peter encounters Jesus, is he falls at Jesus' feet and he says, Lord, depart from me because I am a sinful man. He recognizes in that first moment, this man in front of me is holy and I am not. I'm a sinner. This is a mirror, mirroring of that story. Jesus recreates the miracle as if to say, Peter, you're no, you're no more or less worthy than you were when I first called you. This was always about my grace. This was always about my decision, not yours. He's saying, Peter, I didn't make you depart from me then. I'm not going to now. Come to me. I'm not going to chuck you out. You're mine. You belong to me. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Not only is that, that miracle recreated, but there's this fire that Jesus has made to cook breakfast. When was the last time Peter was around a fire in the early hours of the morning? It was the night that he denied Jesus. Jesus is, is okay with bringing Peter back there. Not to punish him, not to pin him up against the wall and say, where were you? But to deal with the thing that had got in the way. To deal with this sin. To, to name it and to restore. This is our Jesus. This is his heart. He knows that there's sin in the way of their relationship. There's something that has gone wrong here, where Peter has denied him. He's not afraid through the fire and through the questioning. Three times he's asked. Three times Peter denied. Three times he's asked, Peter, do you love me? He's not afraid to bring this up, but it's so that he might restore it's like having a splinter removed. It's painful, isn't it? When you've got something in you that you shouldn't have there, it's painful when you try and remove it. But it needs to be removed. Otherwise, it's going to cause you more trouble down the line. For Peter, every time he would hear a rooster crow, which would probably be many times in his life, be brought back to that place of shame if he doesn't know Jesus dealing with it now. If he doesn't know Jesus in a painful way, removing that splinter, as it were. Peter has known here. It, it, it upsets Peter, that third question. It, it makes him upset. He knows here a godly sorrow. There's a difference, the Bible says, between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is when you've done something you shouldn't do, and it's caused you all kinds of problems, and you're a bit annoyed that you did it. It doesn't lead to change. It actually leads to spiritual death. You're annoyed at the consequences. You're annoyed that people think bad of you. Worldly sorrow is, it leads to spiritual death. Godly sorrow leads to spiritual life, where you realize, oh, I've grieved God, and I, didn't want, I, I love him, and I, I don't want to grieve his heart. I want to honor him with my life. It's a painful moment for Peter here, but Jesus is healing and restoring him. Peter's discovering that no, 
no matter how desperate our failure, no matter how desperate and deep-seated our shame is, Jesus can forgive and renew and restore us. He can do that. He can do that. There was a, a, a writer from the last century called Rita Snowden. And she says, you ask me what forgiveness means? It is the wonder of being trusted again by God in the place where I disgraced him. Jesus is entrusting Peter with some things as he restores him. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. He's entrusting him. It's not just a forgiveness and say, well, you screwed up then, Peter, so you've got to sit on the bench now. You're never going to get anything to do ever again. No, it's an entrustment and a, come on, I've got work for you to do. I've got some things for you to walk in. There's full restoration to be a partner with Jesus in his mission again. We're going to come on to the mission in a moment. He gets to play a part in feeding the flock of God. And as we go through the book of First Peter in the weeks to come, we're going to see that in this letter and in many other ways, Peter plays a part in feeding the church, feeding the, the flock of God with truth. And that book has served the church for generations. And his words today still nourishing people, even today. Jesus has grace, friends. He's got grace to restore you. If you, if you feel today like you are a complete failure, if you feel like you've messed up so badly that you think, this is it now, I, I, it's over. If you're watching online and you feel, I've messed up, I've screwed up beyond the point where God could ever forgive me, you need to understand God's grace runs deeper. He can restore you. He can forgive you. He can clean you. And he can bring you back into partnering with him in mission. This is the grace of Jesus, friends. He's not like us. We have a very kind of short patience threshold, don't we? Someone lets us down, we might think, well, that's it now. No, he's rich in love and slow to anger. We sing that, don't we? Rich in love, slow to anger. They're not just nice words that sound good in a song. They're from the scripture. Psalm 145. He's gracious, compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. This is Jesus. He, he perfectly represents God the Father. He's the exact representation. He's the image of the invisible God. It's not like there's a God hiding behind Jesus who's sinister. No, no. Jesus is gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in love. This is our God, friends. And Peter's learning some things about our God in this moment. He is screwed up royally. He really has. Walked with Jesus for three and a half years, and then when a little girl questioned him, he denied, sweared, I don't know this guy. He's learning that Jesus has grace to forgive. Who else is there? There's Thomas who doubted. Thomas who was one of the, he was the only one to miss out on the first appearance of Jesus to his whole group. And then he's like, no, I don't believe it. I can't, I can't believe this has happened. He's seen Jesus walk on water. He's seen Jesus feed thousands of people. He doubted that Jesus could rise from the grave. There's James and John. Their, their nickname was Sons of Thunder. They had this kind of anger thing going on. These were failures. These were not impressive people. Jesus had grace for them, grace to restore them, grace to bring them to wholeness. So if that's you today, if you're feeling like a failure, can be like Peter and jump in. Run to Jesus. It didn't look very pretty, <laughs> Peter just jumping into the water. It didn't look very dignified. But you can run to Jesus today. And you can know his grace to restore you. You can know it today. He's not going to pin you up against the wall and say, where were you? How could you let me down like this? We see here that he treats Peter very tenderly. And he restores him. He restores him to be part of a mission. The second thing I want to draw out in the short time we have remaining, the great mission ahead. When Jesus first helped these guys catch fish, they brought in a miraculous catch. And then Jesus said to Peter, I'm, follow me and I'm going to make you a fisher of men. It was always in Jesus' heart to see hundreds, 
thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions come into his kingdom. It's not an exclusive thing here. His heart is big. This number, 153 in this story, one uh, theologian from centuries and centuries ago, a guy called Jerome, he came up with this really interesting theory that there was 153 different species of fish on the planet. And therefore, this 153 number was significant because it represented every single nation. Well, sadly, Jerome, there are 24,000 species of fish. So <laughs> that didn't go very well. But what he's getting at here is something that is right. That Jesus' heart is for all the nations. That it is a, a big heart that he wants to see people drawn to him from every background, every culture, every single uh, way of life. He wants to draw people to him. He's got a big mission in mind. But what he's showing his disciples here is that their strategies are not going to cut it. That they need to rely on him. That their cleverness, and these guys were seasoned fishermen. They knew a thing about fishing. And yet they'd fished all night and caught nothing. Jesus is showing them what he had already taught them in John chapter 15, verse 5, where he says, Without me, you can do nothing. He's showing them, you've got to rely on me to bring in the fish. You've got to rely on my power, on my wisdom. You need me. Because Jesus knew where that shoal of fish was at that exact moment. Isn't that amazing? He knows the direction of travel that our country is going in. He knows the direction of travel in your country that you hail from. He knows where people are at. He understands fully. And therefore, it's him we need to rely on. Because we can't make it happen in our own strength. Yes, he wants to use us. He wants us to partner with him in this mission to bring in the fish, as it were. But he's the one who knows how we're to go about it. And so, friends, let us go on being a prayer-filled community. Let it be that our week of prayer was not a flash in a pan, but that in our uh, daily lives as we're walking with Jesus, that we're praying and asking him, Lord, show us, help us, we need you. Because he's the one who understands how to bring in the fish. Even those of us who have got lots of experience, and there's many in this room who've got many years of experience, we can't just rely on our old methods. We can't just rely on the old ways of doing it because Jesus is the one we need to rely on. And he'll show us we need to rely on him. There's a big mission ahead of us. Thirdly, the heart and cost of leadership is something we see here. Jesus shows us in this passage what he wants in the heart of those who would be leaders in the church. I don't believe this is just for those who would have been apostles like Peter or those that would be just be serving as elders or deacons in the church. I believe this is for people who would serve in leadership in any capacity in the church. He's talking about the heart of what he wants to see in a leader here. His biggest concern, friends, is the heart, that it's for Jesus, that it's a heart that is devoted to Jesus. It's not concerned, his heart is not concerned primarily with, have you got a loud enough voice? Or are you decisive enough? Or are you strategic enough? Or are you, if you've got the natural resources? No, no, his, his biggest concern is, do you love me? Is your heart for me? That's what Jesus wants to see. Do you love me? Friends, there's a, there's a real danger that we can slip into, I do all this for you, Jesus. Therefore, you owe me one. Or I do all this for you. Look how much I love you, but we don't actually want to spend time with him. I served you four nights this week, Lord. Volunteered my time. I tithed this money to you. I looked after that person for you. I did all of this, but actually, our heart isn't in love with Jesus. It's not for Jesus. We don't really want to be with him. Jesus said there will be some who say, I did all these things for you, Lord, 
And Jesus said, but I never knew you. His heart's desire, if you're a leader here in any capacity, and if you're a parent, you're definitely a leader. If you're leading in any kind of capacity in the church, his biggest concern for you is, do you love me? Do you want to be with me? Do you love me more than everyone else? Am I number one? But he's also asking a question of Peter, do you love my sheep? You see, when we come to know and love Jesus, it's not right if we just love him, but we don't actually love his church. Like when you see those that get married and they take on someone else's children, when that happens, they're, they're, to, they're actually committing to not just one person, but to the children as well. And this is the same, friends, when it comes to Jesus, that we're to be those that love his flock, that love his sheep, that have a concern for the people of God. That it's not just a Jesus and me deal here, but actually I grow in my love for his people. I don't see that as some kind of like optional extra. <laughs> Jesus is saying, these are my sheep and I want you to feed them, Peter. Listen, friends, Jesus is calling us to love him, but he's also calling us to love his people, to love his sheep. And so often we can kind of see that as well, you know, that's for the pastors. That's for those that kind of work for the church. They can do that. No, 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 he's calling all of us to that, to, to a love for his people, his flock, as it were. And then he starts to speak to Peter of the cost. He starts to speak to Peter. He starts to prophesy, just as he did about Peter's denial, he starts to prophesy about Peter's martyrdom. He starts speaking of Peter's eventual death that will come 35 years later or so, history tells us, where someone else would take him by the hand and lead him to where he doesn't want to go. And history tells us that Peter was crucified in Rome and that he was actually, uh, he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't deem himself worthy to die the same death that Jesus died. There's a cost that comes when we give ourselves to Jesus, a cost that comes. There's a cost that comes from shepherding the flock. And again, I speak to all of us here, really, when it comes to feeding the sheep of Jesus, caring for the sheep of Jesus. There's a cost that comes. I spent a couple of weeks ago, I spent a couple of hours with my dear friend Sheila, who's part of this church, who is a shepherd or shepherdess. And uh, she was tutoring a young guy similar age to me with all of her shepherding knowledge. It was fantastic. I mean, what she doesn't know about shepherding isn't worth knowing. She could make a YouTube channel and become a very rich woman. I'm sure of that. And just in those two hours, I realized this is a very hard job. This is a very demanding job. And in lambing season, you don't get much sleep. And you have to lay down on hay in the freezing cold <laughs> in case a sheep needs to give birth. And there's all kinds of things you have to learn about how to feed them and about how to look after the orphan sheep and about all these things that you have to do when you're caring for sheep. It's not an easy thing. Friends, there's a cost that comes to loving Jesus' sheep, feeding his sheep. There's a cost that comes. Jesus says to Peter, when you were young... <laughs> You got to do what you wanted to do. You got to go where you wanted to go. You got to dress the way you wanted to dress. He's saying, there's, there's the time coming now. There's responsibility coming your way. It's not we really like that anymore. <laughs> we love the nostalgic songs, don't we? Summer of 69. <laughs> Those were the best days of my life. We were young and reckless. We needed to unwind. <laughs> we love to look back and think, oh, when I was young, I had no responsibilities. And Jesus is saying to Peter, responsibilities are coming your way. You can't just go wherever you want. You belong to me now. There's a cost. Christian life is one in which we have to die to some things every day. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must daily 
deny themselves, pick up their cross, follow me. There's a daily dying to some things that we otherwise would have walked in if we didn't know Jesus. That might be reputation. And for some of you, you know that to be very true right now even. That your, your reputation is taking a hit. You're not seen as in. You're not seen as to be celebrated because you follow Jesus. Some of you, it's finances. Sarah and I joke about this sometimes. Yesterday, I was, I was with some people who don't know Jesus. I love them very much. But their lifestyle is quite lavish. And I was talking to Sarah. We were joking about, it. well, that's probably what we could do if we didn't tithe. <laughs> this kind of cost, friends, to, to following Jesus. Some of you, it's literally you fled your nation because you follow Jesus. And you're being persecuted because of that. There's a cost, friends, that comes to following in his footsteps. But it's a glorious thing. <laughs> I'm not saying life is not full of fun and joy. I think it is. I know it to be true. I know, believe that as these disciples followed Jesus, there was lots of joy, lots of fun. But there was a cost. Each one of these disciples, bar John, were martyred for their faith. So there's a, there's a heart that Jesus wants us to have, which is for him first and foremost. It's for his people then as a byproduct of that. But there will be a cost. Things will, will be, have to be laid down. Finally, there's a running in our own lane. And this is, if the band could come and be ready to lead us in some uh, response, that would be wonderful. Peter, as he's going for this walk with Jesus, he turns around and says, Lord, what about him? Have you ever asked that question? Lord, what about her? What about him? It's a very human question. Why isn't my life a bit more like his? Why isn't my life a bit more like hers? And Jesus' response, you follow me. You follow me. John and Peter actually ended up having quite a fruitful partnership together. But their lives would then go in very different directions, very different trajectories. Jesus' is concern is, Peter, you follow me. Don't look to your left or to your right. And even in, as we sing now, don't look to the left and to the right and think, I don't seem to have the, the devotion that they have. I don't seem to have the, the peace that they have. No, you follow me, Jesus is saying. You follow me. As we, as we respond together, I want to encourage us to pour out our devotion to Jesus. To tell him, Jesus, I love you. And some men here will struggle to say that. Some men here will struggle to sing that. But it's not an unmanly thing to do. Peter was probably very, very manly. I love you, Jesus. He was not afraid to say it. Let's pour out our devotion to Jesus. Let's tell him, I love you, Lord. Tell him, I want to love you more. Tell him, I want to grow in devotion to you more. Trust him with your life. Run in your lane. <laughs> Maybe a moment for you to do that now. That you've been concerned with, why isn't it like that person? Why isn't it like that? Trust him with you. Trust him with your life. He's so trustworthy. There might be some here, you just know, I've failed miserably. There's a moment to come back to him. To know his restoration today. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know him, if this is all a bit weird for you, you're so welcome here. But I want you to know something that Peter says in his letter that we will get to in the weeks to come. He says in 1 Peter 2, verse 25, he says, All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. All of us have gone to our own way. But now you have been returned to the shepherd and overseer of your soul. All because of what comes in the verse before, which says that Jesus died in our place on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. All because of Jesus, he offers us new life. He offers us a life where we get returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls, the one who knows every single thing about you. He knows what you were fretting about at three in the morning this morning. He knows the pain that you're experiencing in your 
body right now, in the, in the kind of hip area of your body right now. He knows that. He knows the financial decision that you've got to make this week that you're, you're fretting about so much. He knows the, the broken relationship with your mother that you currently have. He knows every single thing about you. And he's inviting you to life with him as your shepherd and overseer. He doesn't want you to be walking around in this on your own. He doesn't want you fumbling around in the dark, not knowing where to turn. He wants to be your shepherd, wants to be your overseer, wants to look after you. So let's respond together now. You can just, in your own words, respond to this shepherd. Let's each one of us, let's not just watch the band, let's engage with God. He's here. Just as Jesus was there with them eating breakfast, he's here in our midst right now by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you that you're speaking to people now. We want to pour out our love and devotion to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, I love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. You're everything to us. We thank you that you're the God who restores. We worship you now. Amen.